Well, welcome to Programming Tips. In this video, I want to talk about the coding standards you're going to need to follow as you write the Python programs for the projects in the specialization. Now, these standards will be a set of rules that describe how your programs have to be structured to get full credit. The first question that probably crosses your mind is, well, why do we need standards? So let me explain why. Scott and I are sadists, and we love torturing introductory Python students. No, that's not true. We don't like torturing students, although don't take that to mean that Scott's not a sadist. The real reason for having coding standards is that we want to cause you to write your programs in a way where they're self-documenting, that the programs themselves explain what your program does. Remember in the last video lecture, we talked about the importance of documentation. It's something that helps others understand what your programs are doing. So by requiring you to do things like add document strings, add helpful comments, avoid global variables, or choose good variable names, we're going to encourage you to write programs that others can understand. If that's not enough to convince you, I'll just point out the following. If you ever hope to work on a large project in a business or an open source software movement, they're going to have coding standards. And more importantly, you're going to have to follow them whether you like them or not. You're not going to have much say in how those standards work. It's going to be the same in this specialization. We have standards. You may like them, you may hate them, but you're going to need to follow them. So let's go on now and look at a class reading where we've laid out the coding standards for the specialization. Okay, I've loaded the class reading on coding standards that appears after this lecture. And so the reading lists out about a half a dozen rules that you'll need to follow while you're writing your Python programs. Uh, for the rest of the video, I'm going to talk about the first four rules. So let's scroll down and look at the first rule. And it discusses how to document your program. And you're going to document it by providing documentation strings or doc strings. So these are strings that appear at various places in your Python program that help people understand what your program's doing. In particular, you need to place a doc string at the start of your program and also after the def statement in each of the functions, functions in your program. Okay, so um, for the one at the top of the program, it should just kind of say what the program does. For the one after each function definition, it should describe the input and describe the output and say what the function is going to do. So here's an example. I have a one line doc string here. It uses triple quotes. It says this is an example program that illustrates the use of doc strings. And then I have a function here called welcome. And the doc string says it takes an input string location and returns a string of the form welcome to and the location appended on the end. And so notice here that all of these just say what the function does, what the program does. It doesn't talk about how we're going to do it. We'll get to that in the next rule. OK, the second rule in our coding standard is that your program should incorporate comments. Now, a comment is a line that has a hash mark at the beginning, and it essentially has English that describes how your program achieves some task. Remember, doc strings describe what your program does. Comments should describe how the following code does something. Now, one important rule is comments shouldn't be obvious. If I have a line of code that says a equals b plus c, it doesn't add any readability to the program to say um, assign the sum of b plus c to a. Reading that code should be obvious. On the other hand, if I have a formula that spans several lines and involves lots of mathematical operations that maybe computes the distance between two points in the plane, you might want to go through and say, use the formula for Euclidean distance here to compute the distance between two points. That essentially allows the person reading your code to see the, high level, the higher level intent behind a particular fragment of code. Um, the structure of your comments is also important. One pet peeve for Scott is if you want to build a multi-line comment, please use hash marks at the beginning of each line. Note you can do this very easily using Shift-K and Control-Shift-K to comment and uncomment blocks of code. Um, a bad habit is to use triple quotes to kind of make this into one large string. This is a string, not a comment. Please keep the two separate. OK, let's talk about our third rule. This is an important one. It's avoid the use of global variables. So any variable we define outside a function is global. And we can give it a value and we can update it anywhere we want in our program. Now, why should we do this? This is, this is bad programming practice, but let me see if I can explain why it's bad practice. 
Imagine you're writing a large program with, say, dozens of functions. And those are functions are manipulating a set of global variables. As the number of functions gets larger and larger and the number of global variables gets larger and larger, it's very hard to keep track of what the heck is going on. And in fact, imagine now it's not you, but maybe 10 people working on this. It's very easy to have a situation where one person is not aware that functions you wrote actually modified a global variable and misuses your function in a way that you didn't intend. And this can lead to errors that are extremely hard to debug. Now, it's going to be the case you're going to like to go through and have variables that you can manipulate and change and work with. So how can we do that? Just wrap all those variables in a function. If they're inside a function, they're now local. You can go through, you can define them, you can update, it, update them, do whatever kind of computation you want. The most important thing is when you're done and the function terminates, guess what? Those local variables go away and they're no longer there as a danger to somebody who's actually executing a second function after your function. Now there is one situation in which you're allowed to have a global variable according to our coding standards. If your global variable is never updated, if its value never changes, in particular if it's a constant, you're allowed to use it in the program. Now, the machine grader is going to require that you alert the reader to the fact that it's a constant by putting it in all caps. So, whenever you have a constant in your program, you want to use it in lots of different functions, put it in all caps, the machine grader will accept it. However, it's important that you don't go through and change that value later on in the program because then it's not a constant. Okay, let's talk about the fourth rule. The fourth rule is that all variable names in your program should be at least three letters long. Um, they should start with a lowercase letter unless they're a constant, in which case they should be in all caps. Now in practice, when we've used the standard in previous classes, this is the one that has produced the most grumbling. Um, lots of posts in the forms of the form I love using I and J. I'm a mathematician. This is stupid. I should be able to use this. And so in thinking about this, let me explain a little bit about why we've chosen this standard. First, in mathematics, the formulas need to typically be expressed on a single line. You have lots of room to write code. The second thing is these math formulas are surrounded by lots of English that explains what the heck's going on. In your programs, it's mainly code with a modest amount of comments. What I found is that the rule that says you have to make your variable names at least three letters long forces you to think about what your variable does and encourages you to sit down and think about a reasonable, thoughtful name about what that variable does that makes your code much more readable. Let's go back to the, intro, the example of I and J. In practice, i and j usually correspond to indices when you're indexing some two-dimensional structure like a matrix or a table. So if you think about this a little bit, if we have indices into a two-dimensional structure, maybe one choice could be row and column. And notice that if we chose row and column, we'd immediately know by reading the names that they're indices, and more importantly, we'd know if we're looking at the vertical index or the horizontal index. So I think that you'll find if you pay a little bit of attention to your variable names, this won't be much of a burden and it'll lead to significantly better code. Okay, that's an overview of our coding standards. Now you may think that this whole video was an academic exercise because how are we going to actually force you to follow these standards if no human ever grades your code? Well, Scott's pretty clever and he took a program called PyLint that's basically a program checker built for Python and he's adapted it to have it automatically check your code for the standards that I described. So, as you run your program through PyLint, you'll occasionally get errors that say you didn't follow the standards in the following location. If you go back to the top of the page up here, you'll see a sentence in bold. It has a link to a class resource page that discuss, gives examples of various PyLint errors that corresponding to violations of the coding standards and discusses how to fix them. So, please feel free to consult this. My hope and Scott's hope is, as you get used to following these coding standards, what you'll find is that the quality of your code will increase significantly. Good luck when you start on the first project.